Thank you for joining me today. My name is Sarah Vanderheiden, and I'm the Assistant Makery Manager for Elmhurst Public Library, but I also help out with the library's genealogy club. I have a bachelor's degree in history and have done a few genealogy research projects with local history museums. So today I wanted to share some of my genealogy expertise and show you how to access Ancestry Library Edition. In order to access any of our databases, you do need to start on the elmhurstpubliclibrary.org website. If you don't start on the website, the database cannot authenticate you as an Elmhurst Library card holder and it will not let you access the database for free. Once you're on the website, you can scroll down to our menu and all of our databases are in the e-library section. E-Library is our electronic resource section and it has all of the electronic resources available as a card holder. So this includes ebooks, magazines, and our databases. If you're interested in seeing all the databases we have available by title, you can click on all databases by title. But since we're specifically interested in genealogy databases today, we can click on biography and genealogy in this menu. This will list the databases available for writing biographies and then the databases available for genealogy research. We subscribe to three databases for genealogy research. All three of them are owned by Ancestry. So they include Ancestry Library Edition, Fold3, and Heritage Quest. Fold3 and Heritage Quest can be accessed within the library without an Elmhurst Library card or at home using your Elmhurst Library card. Fold3 is specific to US military records, um, so it has draft cards and other military records available. And then Heritage Quest has some census records and some vital records available, but unique to Heritage Quest that is not available in Ancestry Library Edition are the published local history books and genealogy articles. Ancestry Library Edition is normally only available when you're in the Elmhurst Public Library building using our Wi-Fi. But during the pandemic of 2020, um, Ancestry has allowed the Library Edition to be available from home using your Elmhurst Library card number. Ancestry Library Edition has a lot of vital records available, like census records, birth indexes, social security death indexes, passenger lists, and so forth. Uh, it does not have available the newspaper articles and obituaries or the published local history books and genealogy articles. Those records are only available if you have the, the paid-for home subscription for Ancestry. So Library Edition has a bunch of, art of records available, but not those newspapers and obituaries that people uh, like to have access to when doing genealogy research. To get started on Ancestry Library Edition, you're going to click on the link. And if you haven't already uh, signed in with your library card number and last name, it's going to prompt you to put in your card number and last name. Once you've entered in that information, you'll be signed in to the Elmhurst Public Library account for Library Edition. Another thing that's unique with Library Edition is since it's technically a shared account, there is not a way to create or add to family trees. So that's another feature that is not available in the Library Edition of Ancestry. Now before we get started, I just want to show you some of the uh, layout for Ancestry Library Edition. If you're eager to get started and search a person's name, you can either click on the Begin Searching button on the homepage or go to the search, search section in their menu. But before we get started on that, I just want to point out that if you have questions that I don't um, answer in this tutorial or if you need to learn more about genealogy research um, or if you need a refresher, there is the Learning Center for Ancestry um, the Learning Center offers uh, tutorial videos and instructional articles um, for how to use Ancestry. And then the message board is an area you can go to um, search questions you have and communicate with other uh, Ancestry users. So if you're running into a brick wall and you want to see if somebody has um, asked a question about doing specific research, 
that information is available in the message boards. Also on the home page is um, some quick links to some of the very popular uh, collections available in Ancestry. So for instance, um, family trees are very popular in Ancestry. You can browse public trees um, that people have put together, birth, marriage, death records, uh, military records, city directories, and so forth. Another very common uh, collection that people use Ancestry for is the U.S. Census records. So if you wanted to, you can go straight to searching the U.S. Census records. You can search all or you can search by year. Back at the top of the screen is a charts and forms section of Ancestry. This is um, useful if you need to keep organized uh, records for your genealogy research. So Ancestry has um, PDFs that you can download and print out to use, including an ancestral chart. So even though you can't make a digital family tree on Ancestry Library Edition, you can use this chart to keep a paper uh, version of your family tree. And then they also have research calendars if you want to track the research you're doing, research abstract um, forms, correspondence records, family group she sheets. So this is good to use when paired with the ancestral chart. Um, the ancestral chart lets you record um, lineagely, so you know, following your mother or your father back, whereas the family group sheet lets you record their siblings and other relatives. And then a source summary if you want to keep um, summaries of sources you're, you're finding and recording. So again, all of these are available to download for free. You can print as many as you need and use as many as you need for your research. So once we're ready to get started searching, um, we can click on the Begin Searching button here or the Search button up at the top. Now when you click on the Search button up at the top, it's going to ask if you want to search a specific record type. If you are getting started um, with your genealogy research, I definitely recommend searching by all categories so that you get all records um, available for the name you search. I also recommend that if you are starting your genealogy search for the first time, that you search very broadly with as little information as possible. So I recommend starting with the, the uh, person's first and last name. If you try to search with too much um, specific information, like a place where they lived, the year they were born, or relatives they were related to, you might narrow your search results too much and you might not, um, you might not find records or you might miss records with information you're looking for. So again, first timers, I recommend searching a first and last name and seeing how many records you get. I'm going to use somebody who hopefully everyone has heard of, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. It doesn't matter if you use uppercase or lowercase, um, but you do want to try and spell it um, to the best of your abilities. There is a way to search the name using the exact spelling you use or similar spelling. Again, since if you're starting uh, your genealogy research for the first time, I recommend searching the name broadly so you get all search results just in case there's any spelling mistakes or variations in spelling. So we can go ahead and hit search. And so that has um, given us 18,693 records by just searching the name Franklin Roosevelt in very broad uh, spelling. So this could be 18,000 records for people named Franklin, 18,000 records for people named Roosevelt or a combination or people with names similar to Franklin, so Frankie, or Francis. Um, so all of these records, all 18,693 records, are probably not for the Franklin Roosevelt that we are looking for. So this is one of those scenarios where you end up with too many records to sift through manually and you need to start nearing your search results. So to, the way to do this is to use the search filters. So an easy way that you can um, narrow some search results is um, 
searching the name from broad to exact. And there's different options from sound alike to similar. But if you're very certain that a name was spelled a specific way and it might have not been changed or misspelled um, at any time, you can take this, um, this filter and switch it to exact and hit update and see if that helps your search results at all. Now in our case, that took 18,000 records and um, shortened it to 16,000. So we eliminated 2,000 records just by changing the name search to exact. That's still a lot of records to go through manually. So we're going to narrow our search results even more with some of the information we know about Franklin Roosevelt. Now, in this case, we're using a U.S. president, so we are cheating. We have some information about him that we know. So this is easier for us because we know his um, details of his life. But what we would do is go to edit search, and we can put in a place where he's lived. So we know he served as a U.S. president, which means that at one point in his life, he lived in Washington, D.C., We also know that he was born sometime in the 1880s. Um, so if we, even if we don't know his exact year, what we can do is put in 1880 um, or 1885. And just like with the name, we can click on this exact option and it lets us um, search for an exact year or give or take a couple years. So I know he was born sometime in the 80s. I can't remember his exact birth year off the top of my head. So I'm gonna use 1885 plus or minus five years. So this means it will span from 1880 to 1890 for birth year. I can use the show more options to um, add even more information that I might know about his life. So for instance, we know his spouse, the first uh, lady of the United States was Eleanor, Roosevelt. So I've already added three pieces of information to the search. I wouldn't want to add any more because again, putting too much information will narrow the results more and more and you'll end up with almost no results if there's too much filters added. So with his birth year, a place he lived in, and his spouse, I'm going to search. And that has allowed me to narrow my search results from 16,000 to 127. 127 records is still kind of a lot, but definitely not as bad as um, 16,000. So it is manageable to sift through 127 records. It will take time, but not nearly as enough time as 16,000 records. So at this point, we can start looking at some of our search results and see if anything matches um, what we know about him. So the first result we get is actually a family tree that somebody has put together. And it has his name here. And then it has a, a little snapshot of his information on this family tree. Um, so it has the spouse. The spouse matches what we know, Eleanor Roosevelt. And then it has his father, James, and his mother, Sarah, listed. And it has his birth year, which is 1882. So we know that that kind of matches up. And we also know that he passed away in 1945. So all of this information here matches what we know about Franklin Roosevelt. So that means we're pretty certain that this family tree belongs to the right Franklin Roosevelt we're looking for. So if we wanted to see more about this family tree, we can click Franklin D. Roosevelt. And it will give us um, his information that has been added to this family tree. One of the issues with the family trees is that they're only as good as the person who created it and did the initial research. So you always want to look at the family tree and see if they've cited any sources. The way you can do that is under the facts information, you can click on view. And it will list that information for the facts, and then it will um, have any media or source citations linked to it if the person linked documents. Interestingly enough, in this particular family tree for Franklin Roosevelt, the person who created this did not link documents. So that means that technically this information um, has not been verified. So if you find family trees without source citations, I definitely recommend uh, double checking 
the research to make sure that the information is accurate. If you wanted to know more about um, the members of the family tree, any of their family that they're immediately linked with will be listed here on the right. And you can click on any of their names and get the um, entry for their family tree with their facts and their life story as well. So family trees also include life stories. Sometimes the life story is, um, has more information and details than the facts sec section. One thing that's nice with the life story is if the person who created it has the option to insert text box, and so sometimes they will go in more detail than what a record provides. If we wanted to, we could use the tools option here in the upper right to print this information and keep it for our records, or we can click view in tree, and it will give us um, the ancestral chart um, that goes back a couple more generations. And we can click on any of these names and look at their entry with their facts and life story as well. I'm going to hit the back button to go back to our initial search results. So our first search result got us the family tree for Franklin Roosevelt that someone created. The second search, search result that we have is the 1940 U.S. Census record. The census records are some of the most popular records used in Ancestry Library Edition. And um, they're recorded every 10 years in the United States. Now, from 1790, which is when the first U.S. Census record was recorded, till about the mid to late 1800s, uh, the census records only included the full name for the head of the household, and anyone who lived with them was just recorded as a tally, um, so they could record the population of how many people uh, lived in the house and in a town. After the mid to late 1800s uh, to present, the census records became more detailed and included all names of anyone who permanently lived in the household and their relation to the head of the household. And then each record asks, um, each census that has been taken has asked different uh, questions based on the historical context um, happening in the US. So for instance, in the late 1800s, there was a lot of immigration so the census records in the late 1800s will ask questions about a person's uh, um, birthplace for their parents. So being able to record who was an immigrant and who was a first generation American uh, was something that was important to the United States in the late 1800s during the immigration boom. And then in 1940, for instance, during the Great Depression, the U.S. Census record um, had questions about employment because they were trying to track who was working during the Great Depression and who was working um, and being employed by New Deal uh, programs that Franklin Roosevelt established. So you will notice a difference in the questions asked in census records um, each year. Also, census records only become available 72 years after they've been recorded. So the most recent record we have access to is the 1940 census record. The 1950 census record won't become available until 2022 at the earliest. If you do find a census record um, in your search results, the information on the right will give you a little bit of information that you can cross-reference with what you know about your ancestor to see if the record matches that person. So for instance, it lists the birthplace for New York and their residency um, in 1940 when the census was recorded as Washington, D.C. So we are very certain that this is the right Franklin Roosevelt. Once we've uh, reference some of this information and we're certain or almost certain that this record is the one that we are looking for, we can click on the hyperlink or um, hover over the hyperlink, I should say, and it will give you some more information that you can cross-reference just to confirm if it looks like it's the right person. So for instance, um, this information gives us his, his birth year, um, you know, his, mar his uh, marital status, and if we scroll down, his occupation. So this one has him listed as the President of the United States, which means we know um, with certainty that this is the Franklin Roosevelt 
we want. What we can do is click on the link and it will give us the transcribed information on, uh, from the record. So a lot of records on Ancestry have been transcribed, but not all of them, but usually the census records are. One thing you wanna be aware of when you're looking at any record in any transcription is that the record itself was recorded by a human and the record was transcribed by another human and there is room for a lot of human error so it is often um, it's common for people to find spelling mistakes um, sometimes the names aren't spelled right um, sometimes the locations are off by a little bit all of that it can be a common occurrence when you're doing genealogy research because of all of the human error and uh, language barriers involved in uh, recording and transcribing and uploading these records. So if we scroll through, we can see the transcription with all of his information. Um, so his name, his uh, age, his birth year, and you'll notice that usually it'll say about. I'll get into more about that in a moment. And then his marital status, his relation to the head of the house, where he lived, um, including the street and house number. Um, and uh, in this particular case, there was a question asking if his residency was the same five years prior. So all of this information is available in the 1940 census record. And all of this information is super useful because it gives you a, a decent amount of information to go off of to search for more um, records for this, for this individual. Also, it will have a link to any individual who permanently lives in that same household. So these are all the people who have a permanent residency in the White House in 1940. And you can click on any of their names. So for instance, if we wanted to see Eleanor Roosevelt, we can click on her name and get her information from the census record. If we wanted to see the record, um, the original record, and compare the information with the transcription, we can click on the view button there. This will load the scanned version of the census record. You'll notice that um, Franklin and Roosevelt is highlighted yellow. So that's kind of a nice feature that um, Ancestry offers, especially for the census records. Usually it'll highlight the name for the person that you're searching and then it'll highlight green anyone who is listed as being part of that household. So in the previous view, we noticed that there was um, almost 10 people living in the White House permanently. We can see their names here listed in green. One of the nice things about the census records is usually uh, the person recording the census record records the entire street. So in addition to seeing the information for the person you're searching, you can also see information for all of their neighbors. So you can get a context for what kind of neighborhood or um, community they lived in um, with all of this information. Now it's zoomed out pretty far, so it's kind of hard to see this, the info in this record. So there is a menu on the right side um, that lets you zoom in and zoom out. And usually as you zoom in, it will refocus the record so you can see um, the text pretty clearly. And then once um, you're zoomed in, you can click and drag and you can move um, the view to the left and to the right and to the top and to the bottom um, to see all of the information. Another feature that Ancestry has available, especially for the census record, is if you hover over the information, it will give you a transcription of that info. So if we hover over the name, a little text box pops up that says Franklin D. Roosevelt. So if you're having a hard time reading the handwriting, this will help. Um, but again, all of the transcriptions are done by humans and sometimes they will misread information. So you do want to, um, double check, especially if it looks like there might be a spelling mistake, you'll want to look closely at the handwriting and see if you can read it better yourself. Now, the census record um, has a lot of info here. Um, again, a lot of it was transcribed on the previous page, but if we wanted to see more information, we could. And so what we can do is click and drag and come up to the top of the census record. And at the very top, it will list what state, um, 
what town, what county it's being recorded in. You will notice that sometimes the writing has faded um, and that's just due to uh, ink fading over time. And if we go to the far right, we can see the name of the person who recorded the census and the date they recorded it. Now this is important um, to know the date because it can change the birth year somebody uh, was born. So for instance, if you have two members of the household, say a husband and a wife, who were both born in the same year, but the husband has a birthday before April and the wife has a birthday after April, their ages will be recorded differently, but they were born on the same year. So um, using this uh, date to calculate um, their birth year is not going to be exact. It, you're always, you have the potential of being off by a year. This information is also useful if you're trying to narrow in someone's death date. So if somebody, for instance, um, died before or after the 1940, uh, cen um, the 1940 census, you can use this date. If, they, uh, if you know that they died in 1940 and they appear on the census record in April, on April 2nd, chances are they died after April 2nd and vice versa. Now, as I mentioned a little earlier, each census record asks different questions, and those questions are usually based on the historical context going on in the U.S. Um, so, for instance, in 1940, there was the Great Depression and a lot of employment issues, so you will notice that a lot of these questions have to do with employment and education. Um, again, the text is kind of small and hard to read, so as you go through the columns, you can hover over um, the text and you can get a text box that has the information for what they're asking. So it has uh, the first few columns are going to be the address. So uh, one thing that's important to note, um, usually all of these entries are within the same neighborhood, but not necessarily the same street. So on the left side, they usually write the street name uh, vertically like this, and then they'll add in uh, the house number and the lot number. They'll then ask um, questions about if somebody rents or owns their name, um, their relation to the head of the household, so head of the household, wife, uh, child, uh, servant, so forth, uh, marital status, ethnicity, age, um, all of these columns usually get all of the basic information and then it will typically ask um, about where somebody was born, which helps you find a birth certificate, especially in our case, Franklin Roosevelt was born in New York, but this census record uh, takes place in Washington, DC. So we know he at least lived in two different states during his lifetime. Um, some of the other questions on this particular census um, ask about employment. And in this case, like occupation, industry and wages. So on this census record alone, we have the ability to see where someone was born, when they were born, um, what they, what job they had, what type of industry, what type of wage they had, if they owned or rented their house and who their neighbors were and what kind of jobs their neighbors had. So all of this information helps you create a context for the life they lived. If you needed to, um, save this information, you can do so by hitting the save button. And this will give you an option to send the uh, image home via email. So when you click on this, it's going to ask you for an email address. And you, uh, once you send the image home, you'll be able to see this image and this image only from home. You can also save to this computer if you want to save a digital copy um, of the file. You can then print it after saving it. There's also other options um, for changing your view above the, the zoom and zoom in and zoom out options. So that icon with the wrench and hammer gives you options to print or download. You can share um, through social media or through email. And then sometimes um, records come in rotated or flipped, you can use the rotate left, rotate right, flip horizontal or vertical options to rotate your image around if it was not uploaded and scanned in the right format. 
Also, occasionally, um, documents that are stored on negatives and microfilm sometimes are not uh, inverted. So if you needed to invert the colors because they weren't inverted when uploaded, or if you need to invert them um, to make it easier for you to see and read, you can use the invert colors option. There's also additional settings options if you want uh, some of the features turned on or off. One more piece of information that's available on the transcribed version of this is a um, source citation. Ancestry is really nice where it actually uh, creates the citation for you. So if you are keeping um, detailed records or say you are doing research for a history paper or for a book you're writing and you needed to be able to cite your sources, you have all of this information here. This is also another way for you to locate a um, physical copy of the record. So for instance, um, if you found a indexed record but you the scanned image wasn't available in Ancestry and you wanted to obtain a copy of that or um, visit the institution that has it saved in their archives, the source citation here would help you locate that information. So for instance, the National Archives is um, the organization that houses the U.S. Record, uh, census records. So if we wanted to, we could drive uh, to the National Archives, speak to one of their um, librarians, give them this source citation, and request a physical copy of, um, of the census. Other things I want to point out in the search results is different ways that you can filter your um, searches to narrow it down. So we mostly talked about searching using um, a person's information, like where they lived, their birth year, or um, a spouse or relative. But you can also filter by categories. So we found his census records. Say we wanted to see if there's any military records. Um, linked to Franklin Roosevelt, we can filter by military, or if we wanted to see if there was any uh, directories. So the directories are nice because they occur more frequently than a census record. So by searching directories, you might be able to find um, how frequently a ancestor has moved and where they moved to. Um, or if you have an ancestor who immigrated, um, you can search specifically those types of categories. The last thing I want to point out from the home page is the new collections option. So the new collections is also referred to as the card catalog. This is if you wanted to find certain um, collections. So for instance, um, if there was a specific town or a specific type of collection you're looking for, you can uh, browse through this catalog for it or search for it. This uh, card catalog by default is organized by um, collections that have been recently updated or added. So we can see the name of the collection here. You'll notice that this is a population index for Hanover, Germany, and you'll notice that it'll state what language it's in. So Ancestry Library Editions has non-US records available. There's a bunch of European rec records available and other records from around the world, but they're usually going to be in the native language where that it was originally recorded in. So that means you're going to have to um, search that search that record, find the record, and then translate the record. Uh, I usually recommend using Google Translate to um, translate your your information. It's a free service. It's not perfect, um, but it's useful, especially if you just need to translate a couple phrases here and there. So for this population index for Hanover, Germany, we can see that it was recently updated, and then we can also see how many uh, records exist in that collection, so almost 900,000 for this one. We can also scroll through and see that there have been some collections recently added. Uh, so for instance, um, it looks like two new collections recently added had to do with New York prison records and correct uh, correctional facility, uh, facility records. So right next to it, it says new, and it says the number of uh, 
records added. So for these prison records, you have almost 100,000 uh, records added in one day. I want to point this out because um, not every record in existence has been um, researched, scanned, uploaded, transcribed. So seeing this information and seeing when things have been updated is useful because if you are having a hard time finding a record, one of the best things you can do if you've exhausted all other options is wait. So if you wait six, to, six uh, months to a year, I recommend going back, doing the search again, and seeing if you can find it because it does take time to locate these records and add them to the database. And as you can see on this page, they're constantly adding millions of records on a regular basis. If you needed to um, search a specific town or a specific record type, you can do so searching by a title or a keyword. If um, you're not certain about a specific title, I recommend searching by keyword. You'll get more search results and you'll be able to narrow your search results based on what you get. So for instance, say you have a relative that lived in Amsterdam, you could um, type the word Amsterdam and you will get your search results for any collection um, in Ancestry Library Edition that has the keyword Amsterdam in it. So that first one that we see is a population index for Amsterdam, Netherlands from 1780 to 1865. And to no surprise, it's recorded in Dutch. Now, none of these um, records have been recently updated or added. So if you've done a search through these uh, collections already and you couldn't find anything, the chances are that the um, either record doesn't exist or has not been found and uploaded yet. So there would be no reason to research these uh, collections if you've already done it. But say this is our first time searching a collection, we can click on the collection name And it will let us search specifically for that collection. So when I put in a name here, it's only going to find results um, that exist in this population index. So this is useful if you're having a hard time um, finding a record or if you want to find uh, potential related relatives or other records to create a context within a collection. So let's say for instance, the person I'm looking for has the last name Jansen, it's a popular Dutch name, um, but I didn't know their first name or their first name has been spelled a bunch of different ways. Um, I can search the last name Jansen in this population index. And I will get 4,000 results. And then from there, you can use all of your similar uh, search functions. So adding a first name, put, putting in a birth year, um, all that kind of similar information as the other search filters to narrow these results. Um, so this is how you could search by a collection versus uh, doing a search for all categories. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Uh, just to recap, if you have any Further questions about Ancestry or if you want a refresher, the message boards in the Learning Center are good resources to go to uh, for learning about genealogy research or uh, finding tutorials about how to use some of these features. If you have any additional questions, you can email us at reference at umlib.org. Have a nice day.